it's time for News Dump. What's up, guys? Coming to you live from San Diego Comic-Con. Everybody loves how crowded it is here and the fact that you can't get any food without waiting 45 minutes in line. Everything sucks, people smell bad because they're sweaty, and all the exclusives are hours old by the time we get this video up. Just kidding. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah. We're not at Comic-Con. Yeah. Why would we? Boo. But there is plenty of big news out of Comic-Con so far, right? Oh! Uh, not really. Okay. Not really. Pretty much the slowest Comic-Con uh, Monday to Friday week in years, I would say. To be fair, I think historically the trailers are like Saturday morning. Yeah, there's a bunch of big press conferences happening. And guess what? If you love Comic-Con, you're already seeing that stuff. We don't need to talk about yeah. it. So anyway, uh, there probably will be some cool shit by the time the weekend's over, or maybe by the time this video's up. Yeah. But whatever, we can't predict the future. Although we, a lot of times we kind of can, but we're not gonna bother with this one. I'll say it. The Aquaman trailer will be released Saturday morning. Cool, called it. Anyway, ironically, so far this week, the coolest news related to nerd fandom did not come out of Comic-Con and wasn't a TV show or movie announcement, but rather the surprise release of an unauthorized fan film that has managed to fulfill the wishes of the fans far more successfully than the people actually in charge of making the official movie. Well, The Last Jedi came out? Mm, no, after a decade of uh, uncharted fans pointing out that, uh, hey, Nathan Fillion kind of looks and sounds a whole lot like Nathan Drake and would probably be a perfect fit for the role if it ever got adapted into live action. We finally got a chance to see what that would actually look like, thanks to a 15 minute short film that dropped onto YouTube out of nowhere on Monday. And while Nathan Fillion is a famous actor and director Alan Ungar has three feature films under his belt already, this is still technically a fan film made with zero participation or authorization from the rights holders and entirely self-funded with no YouTube monetization. So, and a big disclaimer. Yeah. Alan Unger has been a big fan of the Uncharted games for years and told The Hollywood Reporter, quote, I, like everybody else, felt there was one guy who could do this. I thought, why has nobody tried to do this yet with Nathan? So he said, I will make the Uncharted movie. But not in that voice, because he actually knows how to make movies. <laughs> and uh, had the existing connections to be able to set up a dinner meeting with Phil and to uh, pitch the idea to him. It kind of seems like one of those Deadpool things, where it's just like, make, yes. it, make it and they will come. Yeah, this is definitely a fan film, but I, there's been a few people being like, oh, so this means we should make The Last Jedi. No, 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 no. Everyone involved in this knows what the fuck they're doing. It's completely different. Yes. But anyway, it all, it helps that Fillion himself is a fan of the series and has previously expressed interest in playing the role. So the pitch over dinner was compelling enough to get Fillion to agree to a five day, low budget, stunt heavy shoot during a brief break between his shoot dates on his other actual real projects for absolutely no pay, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Uh, he also put in a lot of time before the shoot studying Nathan Drake's movement and fighting style, and it definitely shows. The whole thing feels the most like a video game come to life compared to pretty much any other video game adaptation or fan film. And that's especially on display during a steady cam third person sequence where the camera rotates around Nathan and the letterbox lines move out of the way and the camera follows Nathan over the shoulder as he shoots bad guys and runs between cover. Oh, and uh, by the way, Stephen Lang is in, in this as Sully and he's perfect. Alan Unger previously worked with Lang on a Netflix movie and is also friends with Lang's son Noah, a producer and fan of Uncharted. So Ungar, again, basically, just pitched the idea and got Lang to show up and be in the film with, uh, for no pay other than lunch, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. You gotta think that uh, Nathan Fillion's uh, other projects, like the insurance people behind them are like, what, what are you doing? Or he didn't tell them, yeah. which is probably more likely the case. Now most of the crew, however, had no idea that they were working on an Uncharted fan film starring Nathan Fillion until he showed up to set wearing the costume and Ungar had to make sure that they all kept their damn mouths shut about it, but it's out now. So, uh, and having it drop this week is no coincidence. Fillion and Ungar are down at Comic-Con right now doing loads of interviews about it and probably having a few drinks with studio execs yeah. at the after parties. Couple who are like, meetings. Man, you guys fucking get it. We've been trying to get this thing. Man, you don't even know. We've been trying to get this thing off the ground for years <laughs> and it took someone like you to do it. Man, we're, this is gonna be so easy. Then that is exactly what is happening oh, right yes. this minute. No. I swear to fucking God. Mm-hmm. It, oh God, I hate Comic Con so much. It's uh, that shit, especially. I mean, in this yeah, case, you guys such a good job. Yeah. So many people saying nice things and being like, "All right, well then, help us out with something." Oh well, I, I don't know. You know how tough things are. <laughs> like, oh okay, well fuck you then. Bye. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but yeah. you're back to Uncharted. 
So yeah, is this going to be a similar situation to Deadpool where, remember, Ryan Reynolds and Tim Miller, they did that test footage on their own and then leaked it onto the internet and generated enough fan they hype. They didn't leak it though, Elliot. It just happened to get on there. Oh, I don't know how it got there. Whoops. But it got online. All the fans got hyped enough and uh, it made people take notice and got the Deadpool movie that we now know and love made. Could this be like that? Well, maybe, but yeah. it's complicated. See, Sony's been trying and failing to make an Uncharted movie for almost as long as the game franchise has existed, and it's gone through so many scripts, directors, and actors that at this point, it's basically cursed, even more so than the Gambit movie. And that's saying a lot, because that movie is fucking cursed. But not as cursed as the Don Quixote movie. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. That movie is fucking cursed. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we, we hosted a panel with Nathan Drake voice actor Nolan North a few years back at a convention where he openly stated that he doubted the movie would ever get made. More recently, director Sean Levy of Night at the Museum and Stranger Things, is atta he's attached to direct a script by Joe Carnahan of the A-Team with Tom Holland starring as a very young Lil Nathan Drake mm -hmm. as portrayed in Uncharted 3 and 4. So it's unlikely Sony is gonna just abandon that in favor of a completely different approach featuring Nathan Fillion no matter how cursed their current thing might be. Almost certainly, it would, if they can't continue to go the way that they are, because of this fan film, it will get panned very hard. Because despite yeah. it just being 15 minutes long, which you could take a lot of ideas for movies that ended up being terrible and make them great in yeah. a 15 minute standalone with no rules. It is, yes, it is worth saying that a lot of bad movies started out as Good 15, ideas. 15 minute short yeah. film pitches. That's a pretty common thing for indie directors to make a like short film or like a scene from the movie, like shoot that and then use that to get attention. And the short will be fantastic, but it doesn't end up actually translating into a good feature. And with film. this with Sony, if they make the other movie with Tom Holland, it will no matter what, no yeah. matter how good it would be, be held up against this 15 minute short yes. as proof that they could have done it better or something. So yeah. it, they are really damned if they do, damned if they don't in this situation. Yeah. But, however, Alan Ungar does raise a good point in an interview with Slashfilm. Here's what he said. When we sat down and I pitched this to Nathan, I said, look, regardless of what happens, I'm going to be totally thrilled if this just lives and dies as a well-received fan film, bringing something to the fans that they've been wanting to see for the last decade. That being said, the best case scenario for us, if we felt this way, is that maybe someone asks if we can continue this story and Sony was interested in exploring it. I think right now we're at a very interesting time in this business where you have cross-platform dis distribution. You've got Marvel and DC who are going from theatrical to digital to network. You've got different actors playing the same character. Look at Gotham and look at the DC films. You've got two people playing Batman. You have the same thing on the Arrow show. You've got uh, Viola Davis playing Amanda Waller in Suicide Squad and another actress on the show. I could go on and on. Obviously, we would be thrilled to see if there's a world that existed where we could continue telling this story, but we will be very happy knowing that it ended with everybody loving it and everybody saying thank you for doing this. Yes. So it wasn't just a let's just do this. It very much seems like they did it with the, at least the hunch yeah, that maybe sure. Sony I mean, would like, be interested in. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like they did it because it would be fun, but also, you know, it, you know, worst case scenario, we have a great time. Best case scenario, this bigger. opens a bunch of doors. But yeah, so what he's saying basically is that in today's media landscape, it would not be crazy to have a big expensive Tom Holland, young Nathan Drake movie franchise over here and a Nathan Fillion Uncharted series on something like Netflix or YouTube Red over here at the same time. It's, it's just a matter of Sony deciding that's something they want to do. Given how poorly they've managed this property outside of the games for the last decade, I would not put a whole lot of faith in them seeing the light, but maybe with enough hype, we can get another Deadpool situation out of this. Uh, the only sad thing is that because it's Sony, it wouldn't end up on YouTube, Red, Netflix, or Amazon. It would be on Crackle. Fuck. Mm -hmm. Or Kim Jong-un would steal all the footage. This is mine now. Anyway, uh, in any case, even if the short film just exists on its own and never becomes something larger, it's awesome that it exists. Just be happy about that. Yeah, a free treat for you just in, yeah. in the days leading up to Something you didn't even know was gonna happen just landed in your lap. Yeah, it's a fun time. Just be glad it exists. But speaking of movies about white dudes traveling to tropical locales to find something hidden away in a cave, there are currently six separate movie projects in development about the Thai cave rescue of the 13 young soccer players and their coach. 
Because the world isn't allowed to just be happy and relieved about acts of selfless heroism and preventing a tragedy. We need the whole thing condensed down to 90 minutes and also heavily embellished. Uh, yeah, we know that just mentioning the white dudes is inaccurate because the Thai military handled most of the rescue, but do you really trust Hollywood to not focus on the foreign divers because they're more relatable and uh, they don't want people to be forced to read subtitles? I don't trust them not e to do that at all. Every diver <laughs> is going to be Scarlett Johansson, <laughs> goddammit. Oh, no. Yep. It's the 13 Thai soccer guys getting saved by Scarlett Johansson and her metal submarine. I, yeah, that a movie by like the guy who does like Veep, mm -hmm. Armando Iannucci about Elon Musk's whole saga through this would be great. Yeah, I don't think that'll happen though. Mm -hmm. But anyway, to be fair, it does sound like at least a few of the projects that are in development are documentaries, so that's cool. Yeah. And uh, the announcement of the six films came via Thailand's Ministry of Culture, so they're at least in on it, and uh, they're overseeing all the proposals. And at least one of the movies is actually a Thai film, so that's good. One of them, though, is being developed by Pure Flix, which is the Christian faith-based production company behind trash like God's Not Dead. Oh, cool. So it's a bit hard to fathom why they would be interested in telling the story of a bunch of Buddhist kids whose former Buddhist monk coach teaches them how to meditate to conserve oxygen, unless, of course, they just changed a bunch of shit or decided to focus on one possibly fictional foreign member of the dive team whose prayers to white Jesus end up being the thing that saves the day. God created that air pocket and he created the stalactites that they licked water off of. Hmm. He so did. Thanks God. Yeah. Thank well, you for, for putting them in the cave and yeah. taking them out. Yeah. He was testing our faith as he's known to do. <laughs> in any case, uh, <laughs> it's just sort of sad and weird that we can't just have real life acts of heroism without them being immediately devoured by production companies who are trying to make a quick buck. Yeah, and before it wasn't like that big of a deal because it was, you got a bunch of movies that came out, they would come out like decades at least after, like at least a decade after whatever had happened. There were a bunch of World War II movies that came out like in 1946. Yeah, like, well, okay. But the, like, the, I, I'm thinking in my head like the Sully Sullenberger thing, like uh, where he landed like on the- Three years. Between. Yeah, yeah, it was just like absolutely no time had passed just at speaking all. Speaking of which, like, I, they, they haven't said, but it's this seems like something Clint Eastwood would be all over. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. His last like four movies have literally just been him like reading the newspaper and being like, let's buy the rights to that so I can go film it next week. Yeah, that's, that's going to be the sequel to Gran Torino where he tells uh, a Southeast Asian kid to get off his lawn. So the get kid out goes, of my cave! So the kid goes into, the, into a cave instead and gets stuck. And he feels bad, so he has to go get him out. He smashes his car through the cave and, and kills a bunch of gang members. Everybody learns lessons, I think. Anyways, here's one big announcement we didn't think would come out during Comic-Con weekend. James Gunn has been fired from Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and uh, you could assume any Marvel property moving forward after old tweets of his were uncovered and publicized where he makes some crude jokes, a few of which are completely indefensible and very weird. Disney seems to agree with Walt Disney Studios chairman Alan Horn saying in a statement, the offensive attitudes and statements discovered on James's Twitter feed are indefensible and inconsistent with our studio's values, and we have severed our business relationship with them. Yeah, so in a series of tweets, Gunn responded to the collection of his old tweets with the following. Many people who have followed my career know when I started, I viewed myself as a provocateur, making movies and telling jokes that were outrageous and taboo. As I have discussed publicly many times, as I've developed as a person, so has my work and my humor. It's not to say I'm better, but I am very, very different than I was a few years ago. Today, I try to root my work in love and connection and less in anger. My day is saying something just because it's shocking and trying to get a reaction are over. In the past, I've apologized for humor of mine that hurt people. I truly felt sorry and meant every word of my apologies. For the record, when I made these shocking jokes, I wasn't living them out. I know this is a weird statement to make and seems obvious, but still, here I am saying it. Anyway, that's the completely honest truth. I used to make a lot of offensive jokes. I don't anymore. I don't blame my past self for this, but I like myself more and feel like a more full human being and creator today. Love to you all. <sighs> yeah, this is not great because a lot of the tweets were very bad. They weren't. The, there was there were some that were just like bad jokes, and then there were a few where it's just like, like not even jokes. Like yeah, where's the joke? Yeah, and especially like with Disney being such a family friendly yeah. and appearing they company. Just fired Roseanne. Yeah, two months you ago. You could understand why she made. You could understand why this happened. Stay uh, the hell off Twitter. Yeah, 
Now, according to The Hollywood Reporter, Gunn has been writing the script for Guardians 3, and the movie was expected to begin shooting in Atlanta in uh, the fall for an expected 2020 release date, though Marvel Studios had never officially announced the date. It would be safe for you to assume that this might get pushed back a little bit. Problematic. Ron Howard, director of Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Ron oh, Howard. yeah, yeah, yeah. Put him in there. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but who knows what, uh, what went on on the set of Happy Days. <sighs> who knows? Yeah. This, yeah, this sucks. Uh, the one thing I'll say is like, the people come to his defense being like, but he was doing trauma films and stuff like that. I was like, it's like, like he, he was a that, full fucking grown man this whole had, time. Yeah, that, that was like 10 years before. These tweets were like 2009 yeah, to 2011. Yeah, he was already like pretty mainstream at that point. Yeah. Uh, Not really the time in your career after writing uh, a bunch of like major motion pictures to talk about uh, getting peed on by kids or having, yeah. having the giving tree give a, a child a blow. And job. they're just not yeah, good they're not like jokes. <laughs> like, no. that's the biggest, like, if they were funny, I'd be like, okay, that's in poor taste, but yeah. I at least see the humor. But there's no fucking jokes here. It's just, it's shit like a edgy, like, fucking 4 chan or 12 year old would like post to Facebook. Yeah, there's one thing about making a joke and having it not stand the test of time as far as society moves and its morality, but there's also a thing about just making. Just, I, I don't even know how to describe these. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. I mean, and it's also, we were talking about this before, but like, it's incredible that those were sitting there all this time. And just, just on his Twitter timeline, he had so many opportunities to be like, hmm, I just got hired by uh, Disney, the most family friendly of the studios. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should pay some intern, you know, <laughs> a living wage to go through those and uh, point out ones that I should probably ditch. Yeah. He had, I don't know, a decade to do that and didn't. And this kind of shit just keeps happening. Celebrities keep fucking up on Twitter. You got Roseanne, you got Elon Musk, you got James Gunn, and there's certainly gonna be more. Yeah. Just, if you're famous or even not famous, it seems like social media Probably not the best idea. It's more of a liability than anything Started else. as a great way to connect with your fans and bounce ideas off and make jokes. Now it's just a detriment to any career. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's just, it's so fucked up that we have, like, now you can get blackout drunk and still communicate with the entire world yeah. in your pocket. Mm -hmm. It's dystopian. You gotta do one of those apps that makes you solve equations before you get I in know. there. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, moving on, uh, earlier this week we spoke about a video game that was so undeniably boring and pointless that the company behind it made the decision to save themselves from future problems by pulling the game off various marketplaces just a few days after it had been released. Well, something recently happened in the film industry that is a little similar. Um, now, movies being funded by Chinese companies is nothing new to the movie industry. In fact, there are certain laws that require an investment from Chinese companies in order for a movie to be released in China because they only accept a certain amount of Western-made films into their marketplace every year unless there's something tying it to their market. Yeah, and a lot of it's like uh, scenes that they film specifically for the Chinese Yeah, and audience. using products that are big in China and, and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, anyway, for about the past decade or so, Chinese companies like Wanda, Hua Hua, Shanghai Film Group, and more had uh, been slowly but surely buying large stakes in movie studios and cinema chains here in the U.S. So a, br a brief summary of these types of deals from CNBC reads, Wanda had led the Hollywood empire building in 2015 by acquiring American film production house Legendary Entertainment, co-producers of Jurassic World and Godzilla, in a deal for $3.5 billion in cash, adding to a U.S. portfolio that included theater chain giant AMC Entertainment and a deal to finance films with Sony Pictures. Holy shit. I know. Uh, <laughs> with these acquisitions and partnerships came the ability for the films they were financing to be screened in China without restrictions, but in recent years there's been a pullback in such investments as a result of what mainly seems like regulatory fears on both the Chinese and American political side of things. Not the best relationship. Yeah, the one around. that sticks out in my head was the uh, one of the Transformers films, and that's why we went to Hong Kong to do the yeah, press junket and that. premiere there and everything like that. And there was someone there from, I forget what outlet, it was a far more reputable outlet than any of the nerd uh, outlets that were there, but it was like, yeah, I'm actually here to really see the story behind the Chinese investment in these films yeah. and the reason why they're putting so much money into them. So that was interesting, but I don't know. Uh, anyways, in the wake of all this and with Chinese audiences expecting big budget blockbuster offerings to continue, you could see why making a $100 million film that looked pretty close to Game of Thrones would seem like a great investment for a Chinese-based company like Alibaba Pictures. 
uh, they would obviously make this using their own local production studios, considering that they'd not only previously invested in American-made films like Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, and Star Trek Beyond, but also found success in other Chinese-made films, albeit for a much cheaper price. But hey, why not go big budget, right? Let's go, baby. What could go wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, over in America, they're saying film, spend, film spend, invest, spend. <laughs> They're saying film investment is one of the worst things you can possibly invest yeah. money in. But here in China, we're gonna test that theory out. And they were right. Fuck. Much like the mistakes made by Hollywood back here in the States, the formula of let's just give this film a gigantic budget yeah. and see what happens. Uh, it rarely actually works unless you have a built-in fan base. So when that new $113 million fantasy epic titled Asura hit theaters and immediately flopped, it wouldn't have surprised any of us over here. This shit happens all the fucking time. Yeah. But the reaction in China was different. After Asura hit theaters and only managed to bring in $7 million, Jesus Christ, during its opening weekend, the decision was made, much like with the culling, <laughs> to just pull the movie from all theaters and hide it away from the public. A very bold move. It's like if it's like if Independence Day came out, what was it, last year or the year before, the sequel? Oh, yeah. And yeah. they were like, no, nah, didn't do good enough. Burp, let's just take it completely off the scene. That's crazy. Yeah. That's just, I mean, at least, at least they're not falling prey to the sunk cost fallacy, mm -hmm. which is how people lose a lot of money in the casino. You think, I've already spent so much. We'll spend more on marketing. Yeah, I've already spent so much, I can't just leave. Well, Elliot, you'll be surprised to find out the rest of this story. Oh, good. So, <laughs> a quote from The Hollywood Reporter reads, Late Sunday evening in Beijing, Asura's official social media accounts posted a simple statement saying that the film would be pulled from cinemas as of 10 p.m. local time. After landing in theaters with limited fanfare, China's priciest picture ever would vanish from the scene entirely. Oh yeah, that's the point I forgot to even point out. Like, yes, it was over 100 million, but this was also the most expensive film they ever made. Wow, yeah. it's their uh, Xanadu. Mm-hmm, which is, I mean, maybe we'll look back on this one with, <laughs> with, with looking back and go, huh, that's something special, much yeah. like Xanadu. <laughs> but at the time, I'm sure people hated Xanadu. Yeah. Yeah, but this is where it gets stranger. Oh, good. Unlike The Calling 2, which is just being erased from existence entirely while they figure out how to make the first title profitable, the producers of Asura are taking it off the market after a wide release and attempting to reshoot and fix the movie so they can release it again at a later date, with a representative saying, quote, This decision was made not only because of the bad box office, we plan to make some changes to the film and release it again. In addition to the fact that they plan on fixing the film, the companies behind it also think that they are falling victim to bots leaving bad reviews on basically what amounts to China's version of Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, they, they should do this with The Last Jedi. <laughs> we're, we're, we're inadvertently proving that point in this episode, <laughs> and it hurts. Uh, they're alleging that the release was, quote, unfairly hurt by negative reviews, and it's explained that, quote, such ghostwriters for hire are known in China as Shui Jun, a, a pejorative term that literally means water army, because companies pay them to flood forums with fake reviews. Which is a cooler term than, like, fanboys or... Yeah. Yeah. Losers. Water army. Yeah. So that day, now from now on, when we see something being brigaded on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, we can refer to it as the water. Get out of here, water soldiers. <laughs> yeah. Go back to your Lord Zeus. Yeah. So I, uh, to be fair, I think the marketing of this movie being so bad and them pulling it is good marketing for the re-release. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes me, I didn't know about this movie at all before. And now I'm very morbidly fascinated by it. I guarantee you wouldn't like it either way. No, probably not. Mm -hmm. But enough about China. We got our own movie funding problems over here in America because once again, Bill and Ted 3 has moved from double confirmed to single confirmed to who the hell knows at this point after months of what seemed like all of the pieces falling into place for this movie. Even recently, the film finally confirmed that both of its original stars would return to reprise their roles. They had an official photo shoot with Entertainment Weekly. It had an official title, Bill and Ted Face the Music, and it was said to be in pre-production. All very promising things. What could go wrong? Well, as far as uh, what the movie is going to be about all these years later, it was described as follows. A visitor from the future warns our heroes that only their song can save life as we know it. Out of luck and fresh out of inspiration, Bill and Ted set out on a time travel adventure to seek the song that will set the world right and bring harmony in the universe as we know it. Together with the aid of their daughters, a new crop of historical figures, and some sympathetic music legends, they find much, much more than just a song. Okay, it's a decent enough concept, Vague. but yeah, and now the future, they should be able to see in the future, obviously, Bill and Ted, go back to the past, future, whatever. Yeah, they use that TARDIS. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, that is seemingly uncertain for old Bill and Ted. And this news comes from a recent interview with Keanu Reeves that he did with Yahoo Entertainment while promoting his latest film, Siberia. When asked about the progress of Bill and Ted, Keanu said this, I don't know if Bill and Ted is a reality. We've been trying for a long time to get that film made, and it still has its challenges. I really love the characters, and I think we have a good story to tell. Part of it is business stuff, financing, rights, deals, nothing creatively. That was well done. Yeah. Anyway, this almost mirrors the issues that were constantly being brought up in the past, but yeah. just, just a few months back, it sure as hell seemed like MGM was fully on board with the project, and why wouldn't they be? Just on name alone, Keanu Reeves can pull in a decent amount of box office, and then you add Alex Winters on top of that. Baby, you're over the line. <laughs> but yeah, you add in all the people who would see it just out of pure nostalgia, and you would have something pretty profitable on your hands, I would assume. Yeah. Because you could just safely assume that this would not be a film with a gigantic, overblown budget. Yeah, it's not a Sura. The original was not expensive. No. And it doesn't need to be expensive. No. So this they could move, they could make, they could make the money on this movie back opening weekend if they just did it with a low budget. Yeah. So this is very confusing. But then again, maybe Keanu is just saying that because he hasn't seen forward momentum and things are just working themselves out on the back end. He, it, That's why maybe why he said it. Yeah, yeah. He, maybe he just doesn't know what's going on. Luckily, I think people can and will be patient for the film since it's already been fucking 30 years since the last Bill and Ted movie. What's another 30 more? I don't know. I can't believe how old that movie is though. Bogus Journey came out in 91 or 92. You forget how old it is because Keanu Reeves has doesn't age. aged Very not at all. <laughs> he looks identical. Anyways, as for the rest of the news and potential trailers uh, hitting the internet thanks to Comic-Con happening this weekend down in San Diego, you know what? You're free to watch those on your own. And we'll, che we'll check them out as soon as they come in and give you our amazing, perfect opinions once we see them. But the Comic-Con schedule doesn't really line up with our shooting schedule, so there's probably a whole lot more news out now than what we're actually covering here. Don't you see Aquaman? This video is already very long, so maybe we'll just do a Monday news dump this week if there's enough worthwhile stuff. Mmm, a nice case of the Mondays dump. <laughs> Big old dump on Monday. Big dehydrated, sickly dump from eating meat and drinking beer all weekend. <laughs> but now let's talk about some trailers. <laughs> First up, the trailer for Overlord, which uh, looks like basically a movie hybrid of Wolfenstein and Call of Duty zombies. All right. Uh, it's about a bunch of American soldiers. They're flying into battle on D-Day. They get their plane shot down, and the only four survivors, they have to parachute behind enemy lines in order to survive. Okay. There they stumble upon a secret Nazi project, and that's where the movie jumps from historical war movie to horror sci-fi, because what they find is a bunch of Nazi super soldier shit that turns people into monsters or something, which they then, of course, have to fight and kill to survive. Now, on the one hand, this kind of looks dumb as hell, but it's produced by J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot. It could definitely end up being some good, dumb, over-the-top violent fun when it comes out in November. I'm at least intrigued. And also in trailers, History Channel, of course, doesn't actually do history anymore, unless they're making history by having Travis Pastrana jump the same <laughs> fountain that Evil Knievel did. God damn it. But their upcoming drama series, Project Blue Book, does actually look pretty cool, and it is historical, though it focuses on a topic where, you know, based on true events definitely means they've taken presumably some liberties. The real Project Blue Book was a top secret project undertaken by the US Air Force to investigate reports of unidentified flying objects. And Game of Thrones actor Aidan Gillen stars as J. Allen Hynek, an astronomer who worked on the project and became a true believer in UFOs and alien encounters. The trailer definitely gives the feeling that this will be similar to the Netflix show Mindhunter, where totally accurate stuff and totally fictional stuff combine to tell a story about obsession. And if that's the case, this should be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, like. This is one where it's like, I really would like them to stick to the facts, because like the truth is interesting enough. Yeah, they don't need to embellish like, as much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So. And then there, we, of course, we've got the first full trailer of the Freddie Mercury Queen biopic, Bohemian Rhapsody. That was released this week, and even though we've heard stories about the remaining band members having full control of the narrative involved in it, which has the potential to be a detriment to the full story surrounding one of rock music's most legendary performers, and you know, the fact that Brian Singer was directing this until he just sort of stopped showing up. For some odd reason. <laughs> and despite Sasha Baron Cohen originally being fully on board with it and then angrily leaving once he found out the how band the, was in control. Yeah. yeah. Despite all that, the trailer for the film does look fantastic. And it appears as though Rami Malik absolutely nails his performance as Freddie Mercury. The plot for the film reads as though the band d definitely had their hands in what the story will explain. Yeah. Uh, 
here's the, here's the description. The film traces the meteoric rise of the band through their iconic songs and revolutionary sound. They reach unparalleled success, but in an unexpected turn, Freddie, surrounded by darker influences, shuns Queen in pursuit of his solo career. <sighs> Having suffered greatly without the collaboration of Queen, Freddie manages to reunite with his bandmates just in time for Live Aid. While bravely facing a recent AIDS diagnosis, Freddie leads the band in one of the greatest performances in the history of rock music. Hold on, does this movie fucking end with Live Aid? <laughs> and then like text, and then he died. And then he just like, they, a frame of him goes off the screen. Ah, that description worries me quite it, a bit. It does. <laughs> and it's very fair to argue that the other musicians in Queen had a very integral part in the success of the band. I'm sure their story is interesting, but... but... <laughs> Freddie Mercury was an enigma of a fucking person. A very interesting person. Yeah. With a man whose whose own story almost demands a movie own, devoted yes. specifically to it. Whose voice w could rarely, if never, be replicated. Maybe, you know, there are people who can sound like him, but he was an originator. He did things with vocals in rock music that had never been done before. Uh, their performances have gone down as the greatest in history, as you see with the Live Aid thing. There's some troubling parts about the general tone of the movie that they're setting out, I feel, but I'm still gonna see it. I have high hopes for it. I wanna have high hopes for it. Yeah. It's coming out November 2nd in theaters, which is Oscar bait time. Mm -hmm. So that's, that doesn't always actually mean something's gonna be good. If there's but, a part of the movie where Freddy leaves for an extended period of time and it's the band struggling to figure out I'm what out. to and then just going, yeah, his solar career is tanking. He's going to come back to us. Bet, like, oh, no, what are you doing? You squandered a perfect chance to make a good movie about one of the biggest rock legends of all time. Oh, no. Here's my Nostradamus prediction for this. It's going to be a while before we can see if it comes out true or not. Here's what I'm predicting. The movie's going to be complete ass but Rami Malek is going to give the performance of a lifetime, which is going to earn him a Best Actor nomination, Yes. while the rest of the film is kind of dismissed as just like, eh, they tried. Just like the band itself. Yeah, you see a lot of, a lot of movies- Freddie Mercury will be the shining point of everything. Yeah, anyway. And you can tell it's, it's affecting the band. Anyways, yeah, the, the, I'm sure uh, it'll be, Rami Malek looks fucking fantastic in he it. He does, and, he's a good actor. I, I hope that it is very good. Um, in uh, the worst bit of Comic-Con news this yeah. week, uh, we uh, regret to uh, acknowledge that uh, John Schnepp, a uh, multi-talented uh, director, Writer. artist, uh, works with a lot of close friends of ours over at Collider. Uh, he passed on the away. the showdown, yeah, he was... He uh, is, yeah, he, uh, very sudden medical emergency last week. Uh, and he has died now, and it's, uh, it's yeah extremely sad. Very shocking. It was uh, he had a stroke last Thursday. Yeah, and they removed a uh, uh, he had a blood clot, blood I clot, think. and he just didn't recover from that. They kept him on life support, but uh, the decision was made after it had shown that he would not recover and that he had lost all brain function. That yeah. they uh, let him pass on and that it's very extremely sad uh, yeah. extremely shocking and um, uh, and it now his uh, his family and his partner they not only have to like deal with grieving, deal with this but grieving, they, yeah. they the whole you know here in America the medical shit it's not fair and yeah. it's very expensive so if you want to help them pay for their ridiculous medical expenses and their funeral expenses. They have a GoFundMe set up. We'll leave a link to that down in the description if you want to help out. Yep. And uh, yeah, rest in peace, John Snap. Yeah. So kind of a sad note to leave on, but... Uh, oh, and go. if you see any of his, you know, friends and coworkers Maybe don't down in San Diego, I feel for them yeah. a lot because they have to, this is the biggest week of the year for them and they have to be on and they got to be moving around and they all just found out that their friend and coworker has died passed suddenly. Away. Yeah. yeah, so uh, just yeah. something to keep in mind. So yeah, sorry to leave on a sad note. Please, if you can spare it, go uh, contribute to the GoFundMe. And uh, yeah, it's, it sucks. Uh, but uh, have a good rest of your weekend. Enjoy the stuff coming out of Comic-Con and we'll see you on Monday morning. Bye.